Um, hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Neve Gordon. And in uh, uh, this month, I will be replacing Nicola Pratt, that's also with us here, who has served as the vice president of Brismas for the past few years. Uh, I don't know if all of you are aware, but Nicola led what I would call the decolonization of Brismas. Uh, uh, changing a lot of uh, 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 the, the the rules and and the approach that uh, Brismas had taken uh, for many years. So, uh, first, thank you, Nicola, for being here and for doing all that. This is uh, 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 this is our last uh, plenary session uh, for what I feel has been this amazing uh, conference. Uh, and uh, I think also Bronwyn is here and she's uh, the uh, major administrator behind the conference. So she's done a terrific job. And I'd like to also thank her for, for it's just been so smooth and, and, and really everything has been great. But we are all here today, actually, uh, to to listen and and to learn from um, Pinar Bilgin, uh, who is joining us right now from the uh, uh, Bilkent University in Ankara, and she is also an associate member of the Turkish Academy of Sciences. Um, Pinar is the author of many journal articles and books in the field of critical studies, including regional, uh, regional security in the Middle East, The Critical Perspective from 2005, The International Insecurity, Security in the International from 2016, and a co-edited volume, The Rutledge Handbook of International Political Sociology and Asia inter and International Relations, Unthinking Imperial Power Relations. Um, she's currently an associate editor at the International Studies Quarterly. She has been an editor in several other journals and has been a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC, at King's College here in London, and in many other uh, uh, institutions and places. Uh, she will be talking to us today on Nowhere to Run, Decolonizing the Study of Middle East Between Area Studies and International Relations. So it's such a great pleasure to have you with us, uh, Pinar. And uh, I'm going to give you the floor and just so people are aware, this is record, a recorded session. And um, um, if there's any problems, just let us know um, in the uh, chat or something like that. So without further ado, uh, Pinar, the floor is yours. In the end, we will take questions. Uh, you can either write your questions, but preferably is just raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask. Thank you. Um, thank you Neil, for the um, introduction. Uh, I'd like to join you in congratulating all the organizers of this conference and also thank all of them. And thank you for also for this uh, invitation. Um, I'd like to thank all of the uh, organizers, but uh, of course, Nicola, who is the person who got in touch with me um, in the very beginning. And, you know, after two postponements, <laughs> we, we've been um, um, still um, a part of this um, in the past two years. So it's a privilege and a pleasure um, to be addressing you today. Um, when I was invited to address Christmas, I was presented with the same challenge as with all the participants, and I'm here reading from the conference text, to reflect on the concept of decoloniality and practice of decolonization of knowledge and pedagogy in relationship to the study and teaching of the Middle East. This is no small task. Over the course of the week, I've heard many of you reflecting on the magnitude of this task. I've also heard many innovative ways in which many of you are attending to this task. This is not something that I'm used to, I have to say, 
partly to my specialization in security studies, very conservative subfield of international relations, sometimes even in its critical versions. So unless you stay within a small circle, within a small circle in international relations, the cause for decolonization raises eyebrows. I, I know that IR in the UK has got changed quite a bit in the past two years, but still. And I have colleagues here at home and also internationally who bristle at the mention of Eurocentrism, let alone racism in international relations. This is not going to come news to any, any of you. So it is very refreshing to have had the experience of the past week. And let me once again express my gratitude as I begin. What I would like to do today is to speak to not only those who are already sympathetic to this agenda and already doing their bit, but also those who are in principle open, but have not yet acted on it. For those who do not need convincing, some of what I have to say may be helpful in talking to their students about the issue. I say students because they are our ultimate audience as teachers. And as many speakers already have said, heard them say this week, our students may be more open and informed than anyone else that uh, we encounter um, in the corridors of our respective institutions. Okay, now I'm saying this to remind of my, also myself that decolonizing can't be a primary research agenda for all of us. But we can all try and do what we can to rethink the premises and implications of our day jobs in our respective fields, in our respective disciplines, in our corners of the world. I have a twofold task today. First, what I'll talk about what the title of the talk promises. Okay, that the study of the Middle East is being caught between area studies and international relations. Neither of which have the best track record when it comes to reflecting on power knowledge dynamics. For all the talk about power and knowledge in critical IR in the 1990s, we seem to have scratched only the surface. So this is what I mean by having nowhere to run. But then there are avenues opening up some are actually attending to the decolonizing agenda, others having more modest ambitions. So my second task today is to identify three of those avenues that are opening up, and I'll express a preference for one of them. So in doing so, I'll begin with Edward Said and also conclude with him, but say a few different things in between. Okay, but the conference text also makes a note of Edward Said, his groundbreaking contribution. It says that many of the issues that are currently on our agendas were, quote, highlighted many decades ago in the work of Said, among others. Quote. Indeed, Said's work before and after Orientalism has inspired the calls for decolonization of knowledge in multiple branches of social sciences, humanities, and beyond. Yet here we are discussing the ways in which Middle East studies needs decolonizing 40 plus years after the publication of Orientalism. So how is it that we are still talking about decolonizing Middle East studies, given that one of the key texts that started it all had begun to do exactly that? This is, isn't this a little bit puzzling? Having identified our limitations, how is it that we have not left them behind? I suggest, and this is not a fully fledged argument, right? I suggest that this may have, this may be because where the Middle East, students of Middle East studies have sought refuge for, from Orientalism and area studies. They've sought refuge in the disciplines. IR is my particular discipline, but others may speak about their own disciplines. Okay, so it turns out that our disciplines had their own problems with knowledge power dynamics in ways different than Orientalism and area studies perhaps, but they do. I'll say more about the disciplines, but let me clarify my point about Orientalism and the study of the Middle East. What I suggest here is that the reason why turning to the disciplines has not meant that we have left these issues behind 40 plus years after the publication of Orientalism is because we focused only on one part of the problem, okay? For years, we focused on the knowledge power dynamics in the Middle East, Middle East, mostly in terms of the ways in which knowledge has served power, be it 
in Oriental studies or area studies. Orientalism had served colonial powers. Post-World War II area studies had served United States among other great powers. My intention here is not to actually rehash the area studies versus disciplines debate of the 1990s. Just to note that those discussions were shaped mostly by the way research funding works in the US, but they reverberated beyond the US at a time when the cold, close -knit, uh, cold War era relationships between um, universities, think tanks, and policy was becoming more and more explicit owing to a number of key works that came out around that time. What was revealed in those works only provided further evidence to a part of Said's argument in Orientalism, but please note that I'm saying part of his argument there. So if one part of his argument in Orientalism was about the more direct, if not explicit, relationships between power and knowledge as regards the study of the Middle East, the other part was more theoretical about how representation constitutes its reality. Here, the argument was not specific to the Middle East. Right? And I suggest, as students of the Middle East, insofar as we focused on one part of the argument and less so on the other part, we have failed, I, I suspect, to prepare for the challenge in front of us regarding the decolonization of the study of the Middle East. It may be that our own exceptionalism may have rendered us less than prepared for this challenge 40 plus years on. Now, as I say this, I am fully conscious of the very important works some of um, our colleagues have done, who have done exactly that, right? Uh, precious, uh, what I say is precious little off in the field, engage with the theoretical aspect of post-colonial contributions while keeping the Middle East as their empirical focus. Um, Tim Mitchell's work comes to my mind. There's also Sandra Halpern's work. And there is Robert Vitalis, right, who wrote a key text um, years before the Race and IR book, for those of you who are familiar with the discussion in that book, uh, who wrote a key book on Saudi Arabia, the United States, and the ways in which the US-Saudi relationship in its early period was uh, shaped by racial differences, right? Vitalis's book is a pivotal study that took important steps in terms of the issues being discussed this week, yet that is not always known to students of the Middle East. So to return to the point that I'm trying to make here, um, Taking our cue from one part of Said's argument that was more specific to the Middle East and more about the direct relationship between power and knowledge, and maybe overlooking the implications of the more theoretical part, which is about how um, representations constitute reality, many students of the Middle East have sought refuge in the disciplines without necessarily reflecting on the limitations of those disciplines. Okay. Let's also make a note of the fact that, uh, you know, the theoretical part of the argument may per perhaps may have gone against the ways of knowing and uh, that dominated in the disciplines at the time. So that's also a possibility to post it for the, the taste of some in the disciplines. That may be the case or that may still be the case. So that's that. The disciplines that the students of the Middle East have turned to had their own problems, as I said. And those problems are coming to the surface more recently, okay? Um, there was always, as I said, a co concern with power and knowledge in, in critical IR, but it only scratched the surface, surface regarding the ways in which the discipline IR has been shaped by concerns with ordering the world, right? IR knowledge has been shaped by concerns with ordering the world, not only by concerns with peace, that's the story we are often told, right? but also by concerns with holding on to a hierarchical order of the world's peoples and understood an approach in racial terms has to be noted. I've already re uh, uh, referenced Vitalis's work here, but we can also refer to Chowdhury and Nair's book, um, edited volume. There's also Lili Ling's work on Asia and the West. Okay, so what do I mean when I say knowledge being shaped by concerns with ordering the world? There is the more everyday understanding of the relationship between power and knowledge, as with those who are in power seeking to produce knowledge that would be supportive of the policies that they seek to pursue. Okay, more everyday understanding of the relationship between power and knowledge. Relationship between some think tanks, some political parties, governments, regimes is an instance of this more everyday understanding of power and knowledge dynamics. Knowledge that is directly and sometimes even explicitly produced to serve power, 
But this kind of direct relationship between uh, knowledge and power is not exactly what I have in mind when I talk about concerns with altering the world, shaping knowledge. What I have in mind is a more subtle relationship that exists in our concepts and categories, right? a more subtle relationship that exists in our concepts and categories, in our ways of knowing, and in the ways in which we anchor our ways of knowing. It exists even as we have no desire to serve power in our knowledge production. It exists when no one may be funding our knowledge production. It exists even if, as we explicitly seek to resist power in our production of knowledge. So when I, building on the IR training that I received in Turkey, sitting in my university office here in Ankara, define security as a threatened use of war by states vis-a-vis -vis other states. I may not produce knowledge to serve any power. I may not be concerned with ordering the world in a particular, for a particular state, right? And when I building on the IR training that I received in Aberystwyth, again, sitting here in my office in Ankara, define security as emancipation or adopt Copenhagen school definition of security as a speech act, I may not be concerned with ordering the world for the purposes of anyone. Indeed, as a critical IR scholar, I may be trying to reveal the workings of power, or if I am more of an activist, I may be explicitly seeking to resist power. Still, what I do is shaped by IR's concerns with ordering the world, insofar as the concepts, categories, ways of knowing that I utilize are drawn from international relations. Even if I'm a critical IR person, this is likely to be the case for reflexivity has its limits. I quote uh, Vivek Dareshwar here, who says, theory as an institution is implicated in the strategic play of power. A genuinely self-reflexive theory, he says, must theorize not only the rhetorical constraints it faces, the more ob obvious aspects, but also the political, institutional, and epistemological constraints within which it must operate. This is the relatively more difficult part when it comes to reflexivity. It's no easy task. Let me give you an example. When we analyze security in some parts of the world as state failure, the concepts of security, state, and sovereignty that we use in our analyses are all tied up with concerns with ordering the world. We may be very critical of the treatment of so-called state failure. We may be critical of labeling some states as failed states. We may want to argue that our standards regarding what is failure and what is success are problematic. In all three cases, we'll be operating with the same notions of security, state, and sovereignty as we've learned in IR, traditional or critical. What escapes us in all three cases, and here is the moment where we, IR needs decolonizing, where the moment for decolonization, decolonizing knowledge crystallizes, is that the notions of st security, state, and sovereignty are tied up with concerns with ordering the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. I turn to Siba Grogi here to his discussion on the differential treatment of some African states and some Western European states in the 19th century, Siba Grogi's work. He shows that while Western European states benefited from the norms and practices regarding statehood and sovereignty that were being, developing, being, being developed at the time, right? Some states are benefiting from the norms and practices regarding statehood and sovereignty that are being developed at the time. Many African states, he argues, were differently treated. Sovereignty principle was applied differently. One set of norms and practices for Belgium, I'm staying with the examples he uses, another set of norms and practices for Congo. Grobogi's argument is not only about the colonial relationship between those two, Belgium and Congo. It's not just that, right? But also, perhaps more so, about the colonial context in which they were treated differently by everyone else, okay? Not just the colonial relationship between those two that we also know of, right? But everyone else treating uh, these two states differently. Such differential treatment, he says, meant that one was allowed to stabilize and the other was not, okay? So every time they analyze some states as failing and others as having succeeded, we're missing that context, he says, and the constitutive connectedness of 
some in Western Europe and others in Africa. Okay, so decolonizing concepts are refers to not only revealing the colonial relationships between countries, but the colonial context in which our concepts began to emerge and develop. Okay, it's not a matter of lack of something in such context, lack of statehood in some context. It's not that concepts don't travel, right? These are two prevalent responses to the kind of um, failure that we observe in, in, in some uh, states. I, I'll come back to these two, uh, this uh, discussion on these two. The problem here is that these are concepts that are shaped with concerns with ordering the world, okay? A different kind of problem. So when we write the history of state formation, a genealogy of sovereignty or a genealogy of security, we overlook not only such constitutive connectedness of the colonizers and the colonized, right? The relationship between those groups of states, but also how coloniality shaped our concepts, categories, and ways of living for everyone else, right? Not directly involved, but everyone else. Here, the, I'm pointing to actually three kinds of constitutive connectedness. One, the one that we know more of, providing bodies and land whose labor and riches are usurped, right? This one, even the skeptics more grant, right? There was colonization in history. They may not do anything about it, but even the skeptics were, would grant that you know, there, is a, uh, there is something to be acknowledged there in terms of um, the relationships. The second one is the self-other relationship, othering, constitutive connectedness, right? This one is explored mostly by critical IR scholars. But there's a third, there's a third one, the one that I find more productive in terms of, in, in terms of the kinds of analysis that I uh, uh, do. And this constitutive connectedness between thinking actors, right? What uh, Sankaran Krishna refers to as the intimate dialogue between Western and non-Western economies, societies, and philosophies. Okay, I'll say this again: the three the constitutive connect the relationships of constitutive connectedness. The first one is material give and take, exploitation, if you wish, the one that we know of. The second is the self-other relations, could be about identity, could be about East-West relations in general. The third one is about shaping each other's ideas and institutions. And that kind of shaping may be for the better or for worse, you know, it has to be said, because learning is not always for the better. Okay. So as I understanding, Grovogi is exploring this third kind of constitutive connectedness, that our notions of statehood, security, sovereignty were shaped through these encounters, right? Our notions were shaped through these encounters. Having said that, we don't find any of this in our textbooks. There is no recollection of any of this in our IR narratives. And in the absence of such recollection, the disciplines remain unaware of the imprint coloniality, not just colonial, colonialism, but coloniality has left on their concepts. Um, in introducing a 2000 collection of his essays, uh, Manuel Wallerstein, recalls that when he started his career many years ago, all he was interested in, he says, was empirical analysis. So he was interested in Wallerstein, he was interested in Africa, and that's where he started in African studies. But he notes that soon he became aware that the very tools of analysis were themselves to be questioned. The ones he says I'd been taught seemed to, be, seemed to me to be to circumscribe our empirical analyses and distort our interpretations. So someone who wanted only to do empirical analysis moves into more theoretical explorations in his um, career. As I tell my students, uh, when they get too bored with uh, theoretical discussions, you, you may not be interested in theory, but theory is interested in you. Okay, so I have talked about the ways in which the study of the Middle East has been caught between area studies and IR neither of which have a track record, good uh, track record when it comes to reflecting on power knowledge dynamics. Now I'm moving on to my second task, which is identifying avenues that are opening up and then express a preference for one of them. I'll again identify three. There are more. I picked up the ones that are, I picked the ones that are most prominent from where I sit and follow globalizing IR debates. One of them is non-Western IR. 
focused on IR, but you can see parallels of this kind line of argument in other fields too. So it's going to be familiar for those of you who are not in international relations. So non-Western IR. The second is decentering. Again, is likely to be relevant for those of you who are not in international relations. And the third one is connected histories. It's likely to be too, very familiar to those who are doing history amongst you. Okay. The third takes its cue from Said's notion of uh, intertwined and overlapping histories, but also historian uh, Sanjay Sobrabrahmanyan, Sobrabra, Sobrabra okay, it had to happen, struggled with one of the pronunciations of names, and finds very helpful exploration in Gurminder Bambra's connected sociology studies. Okay, so I'll say more about one and two, what I see as their limitations as regards the decolonizing agenda because they come across as allies to begin with, right? It turns out that they're not. And then I'll say more about the third one, which is the one that I um, prefer in, my, in terms of my own analysis. Okay. Now, non-Western IR, the first avenue, um, does not seem to have very many takers in the study of the Middle East, so far as I know, but the affinities are there. And that's why I chose to include that. Non-Western IR begins with the observation that Western concepts have limited relevance elsewhere. Scholars even cite Edward Said's traveling theory argument to boost their point. But then the argument that they make, I think, pivots to something that in my reading goes against Said's argument altogether. They suggest that theory can't travel, whereas in my reading, Said does not say theory does not can't travel, but it, things happen to theories when they travel, and that it is interesting to analyze what happens to theories when they travel, when they find themselves in different places. Okay. In the Middle Eastern context, for instance, the argument finds itself, um, or the argument finds its, its uses in the discussions on, on security, right? that limitations of state-focused conception of, of security within the Middle East context. Uh, Bhagat Korani made this point in the 1990s before anyone else, but this is not, you know, it was not his conclusion that Western theories don't work in the Middle East. He was making an entirely different uh, point, um, and you may want to refer to his text and how innovative his theorizing is in the 1990s. To jump from that observation that you know, the concepts that we use do not seem to work in the Middle Eastern context, and to, then to say, you know, therefore we need a different concept of security for the Middle East is an entirely different point, right? One that he does not make, but non-Western IR seems to be interested in making that uh, point. Okay, so let me restate my point about non-Western IR before moving on. To say that we need different concepts for the Middle East misplaces the problem, I think. Misplaces the problem. The problem is not with the Middle East, it's with our concepts, right? But then, you know, feminist scholars have said this before post-colonial approaches, right? We need concepts that are better able to capture our insecurities, they said, during the you know, nuclear weapons, nuclear, uh, nuclearization dis discussions in, in the 1960s. Um, I can quote Uma Narayan here, she says, what feminism offers is not adding things, not alternative knowledges in the words of some, but shifting our perspective so that we see things anew, okay? So the problem is not with the Middle East, not because theories don't travel, they travel all the time, so it said in that realm text, or that they do not travel well, again, beside the point, the problem is with disciplinary IR and the concepts that it offers us. Okay, to remember Grawagi's examples that I referred to, our concepts do not just fail in Congo, they also fail in Belgium. Okay, this is also similar to the point uh, that uh, Sandra Halperin makes in her mirror in the, uh, in the mirror of the third world book. Entirely different focus there. Yeah. Okay, in short, non-Western IR misplaces the problem and therefore is not a, a, I consider to be a satisfactory strategy for decolonizing the study of the Middle East, although it, I know it comes across as an ally in the first instance. Okay, so second, decentering approaches. Again, 
sounds like a potential ally for the decolonizing agenda. Um, for instance, scholarship seeking to counter Eurocentrism in the study of the Middle East point to the colonial past and the ways in which colonialism has been constitutive of Europe, material terms mostly, right? And furnished with this knowledge, scholars encourage the students of the Middle East to move away from a European outlook and engage with each other and learn from each other. How to do this? Seek out non-European accounts of the Middle East, seek to make sense of the worldviews and value systems by which they're underpinned. Sounds good, right? Yet while it is laudable as an initiative to turn to others and ask, so what do you think about this, that, and the other thing, right? What is your perspective? It is less than commendable, I think, if such initiatives are interlaced with the assumption that those others that we're asking have not been constitutive of this, that, and the other thing, right? Shall I say this again, right? It's nice as a gesture, perhaps, to ask, other, turn to others and ask them, so what do you think about X, Y, and Z? But it is less than commendable, I'm saying, if such initiatives are interlaced with the assumption that those others that we're asking have not been constitutive of X, Y, and Z. Decentering approaches in my reading imply that the international is the making of the center all by itself, okay? On the one hand, decentering approaches do acknowledge material exploitation. They exp and also acknowledge self other dynamics between the center and the periphery, okay? They highlight the ways in which periphery has provided bodies and lands. They also talk about how the, uh, the periphery has served as an other to one's own self, right? So the first and the second kind of constitutive connectedness that I was talking about. Yet, on the other hand, they fail to consider the Middle East as a home to thinking actors, right? As a home to thinking actors whose ideas and institutions have been co-constitutive of the things that we're talking about, right? Middle East as a home to thinking actors who have been co-constitutive of those ideas and institutions that are otherwise portrayed as developed entirely by Europe or the West, okay? So I'll say this differently. The Middle East makes an appearance as having been deprived of its riches or as an other to center self, but not having a word to say until it's being asked now for us. Now, to my mind, this is not only not enough, right? But also counterproductive insofar as the decolonizing agenda is concerned. It is counterproductive, I think, in the sense that by virtue of overlooking the Middle East as co-constitutive of those ideas and institutions that make up the international, these centering approaches have allowed totalizing conceptions of the international to remain unsketched. The risk in decentering, which is understood as turning our gaze beyond the center to the periphery, the risk in doing that, understanding our solution as doing that, would be, and I'm quoting Robbie Shilliam here, is that the familiar remains familiar, right? And the unfamiliar remains unfamiliar. We are familiarizing ourselves as in defined in the, the very existing terms. So decentering is not enough if it leaves the central center untouched, if it leaves the center's concepts and theories untouched. It is not enough to turn to others and ask, so what do you think, okay? Now we are coming to the third of the three avenues that I have identified to begin with, which I think is a better option for the decolonizing agenda those who do not leave the center intact, I suggest adopt a connected histories approach where the idea is to center, study the center and the periphery together, okay? Not turn to the periphery and ask, so what do you think? But study the, them together by focusing on their constitutive connectedness. Okay, let's acknowledge that there is a paradox here. Okay, it's a paradox that we can't really escape, only acknowledge it and think through it. The paradox here is that 
Some have been left out of the narratives that the center has produced. I'm thinking about IR's narratives about world politics here, okay? Being left out of IR's narratives is not the same thing as what has transpired in world politics, okay? Those who do not feature in IR accounts have been constitutive of world politics in one of the three ways that I have identified, material exploitation, othering, dialogue, or learning. Okay, so when I say, with, uh, not to be confused with what has transpired in world politics, of course, I'm not making a claim to know what has really transpired in, uh, in history, right? That's not the claim, but to just to underscore that the exclusion of some from IR's narratives is just that, exclusion from a particular narrative. Okay. Those who are more well-versed in history and historiography um, would be able to better formulate the argument that, um, that I'm drawing upon here, right? So exclusion from IR's narratives is just that, exclusion from a particular narrative. Okay. No need for me to tell you that narratives are not without consequences and the exclusion of some from IR's narratives has had consequences. And one such consequence is that when the students of the Middle East turn to the disciplines in general and IR in particular, they found concepts, categories, ways of knowing that have been shaped by those dynamics, right? Yet no memory of that, not in our narratives. And even now, right? When we're interested in decentering, when we're interested in globalizing IR, the most plausible solutions to the problem as we diagnose it, seem to be shaped by the same limitations, okay? I'll say this differently. Even the remedies that we adopt to decolonize the study of the Middle East turn out to be informed by coloniality, okay? Even our remedies seem to be informed by coloniality. I don't mean to sound pessimistic here. I'm not pessimistic, right? I'm suggesting that our reflexivity needs to go further, deeper. Right? Remember the Dareshwar quote from earlier in the talk. Self-reflexive theory must theorize not only the rhetorical constraints it faces, right, but also the political, institutional, and epistemological constraints within which it must operate. Further, deeper. Eurocentrism is a limitation for the study of world politics. Not only when we look, look beyond Europe, but also when we look within Europe. Eurocentrism is a problem right? Not only when we look beyond, but also within Europe. So decolonizing the study of world politics in general, and the Middle East in particular, is about designing a research program to study the center and the periphery as a whole. Okay, this is where I remember I said I'll end with uh, Said. I'll begin with Said and end with Said. This is where I turn to Edward Said's method of contrapuntal reading. He proposes um, contrapuntal reading in his um, 1975 book, Beginnings, Intention and Method, reintroduces it fully in his 1993 study, Cultural and Imperialism. Um, adopting a contrapuntal reading as a method, he suggests, is the only way in which what he calls intertwined and overlapping histories of the colonizer and the colonized could be grasped. Right? And everyone else, we may want to add, because we're talking about coloniality, not only just colonization. The colonialism point, of course, was made previously, and famously by Franz Fanon, right, who had highlighted in 1963 that a non-Europe was already a part of European achievements. Um, Fanon there was talking about the material riches in particular, but there is also an ideational dimension that is brought up much more clearly in, in, in Said, I think, uh, that um, and scholars from multiple disciplines have been inquiring into this um, in the last decades. Of I've already referred to Bambra's work in sociology. Um, there are more, right? And it's, sometimes it's difficult to keep up with the interesting work that is com uh, coming out. That is exactly doing uh, what I'm talking about here in terms of making use of um, the connected histories approach to uh, um, adopting their own disciplines. So those works already exist actually, they're increasing. And it's, it's part of our job then, if we're interested in this, is to read those works when they exist. When they don't, right, then it becomes our job to produce ours by reading contrapuntally ourselves. 
And this is something, if you're interested, that can be done by anyone regardless of what they're interested in, right? And I'll set this in the beginning. Uh, decolonization can't be the primary research agenda for any of us, but regardless of what we're interested in, and this could be something very empirical or something theoretical, we can all do our bit in terms of uh, adopting these methods to study what we're, um, what we do in what I call our day jobs, right? And once we raise our uh, contrapuntal awareness, as Said advises, and go looking for different narratives to read contrapuntally, we're likely to see that they actually exist. And sometimes, you know, they exist. I only know two languages that is Turkish and English. Sometimes they exist in, in English, right? I don't need to go beyond my linguistic skills either. There's a lot that is out there if only we go um, looking for this. Not necessarily in known outlets, right? Not necessarily in our course syllabi, not necessarily in the reading list that may, our professors may have provided us. But once you go beyond known outlets, right? The textbooks that we're uh, accustomed to reading within our own scholarly communities, once you go out looking for them, you'll find that they exist. Sometimes in other disciplines, but they do exist, right? Um, now, you may think that this argument is a little bit too vague. Um, I have attempted to do this um, previously, so I may talk about some of the um, my own attempts, but um, in the interests of time, I think I'm going to um, not refer to my own work, but I can come back to it if you're interested in the discussion section. So I'm going to conclude now, then. Um, I'm suggesting that uh, attempting a contrapuntal reading is about thinking through and interpreting together, Saeed's words. Thinking through and interpreting together texts from outside known outlets, right? Things that we're used to reading, things that we are being presented with regularly. Text from outside the known outlets, together with texts that we are accustomed to, right? Experiences and privilege, uh, histories of the privileged, right? Read them together to understand how relations have been constitutive of both of them. Said's so point here, drawing from his interest in music, as with contrapuntality in music, he says, the individual narratives make sense. So the the histories of the privileged make sense by itself. Texts outside known outlets make sense by themselves. Individual narratives make sense by themselves, but they also come together, he says, to form a story and sometimes a very unexpected story when read together. I'm going to leave it here and I'm going to come back to some of the these, uh, themes that I have, I know I have left underdeveloped if there is an uh, interest in them. So I'll respond to questions with more examples if you're interested in them. So thank you. So thank you very, very much. This was uh, very, it was just fascinating. I kept on writing down. And uh, now uh, we're open to questions. So um, preferably if you raise your hand, that would be our preference. But if you have problems with bandwidth or you feel more comfortable just writing it, you can. I can already see we have a first question from Ray. So Ray, please go ahead. <clears throat> Ray Bush. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Neve. Thanks very much um, for an yeah. incredible uh, presentation um, and all its uh, dynamism. Um, I'm interested in perhaps a couple of things that were not said rather than the things um, that were said, which of course is the nature of this kind of interrogative <laughs> procedure. Um, and it struck me as being very important that you talk about this idea of connected um, histories and, and centre and periphery. And you refer to, but don't deepen the reference to the late uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. But it seemed to me that one of the absences of those that you refer to, of course, was not an IR person. And, and why, why should you, I guess? But that's the work of the late Samir Amin. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, the significance of his work in relation to center periphery 
but also two categories, which of course he did work with, but you did not refer to, and that's class mm -hmm. and, and imperialism. Because of course, IR tends to eschew any examination um, of imperialism for very um, obvious ideological and very conservative reasons. But I just wonder where and how in your characterization of connected histories, you would locate, and I would hope prioritize imperialism mm -hmm. as a driver for the characterization of the interconnectedness to which you refer. And in so doing, I wonder whether you would also reflect on, you know, again, to kind of paraphrase Fanon, which is who you also refer to, how one gets out of the dark night. Mm. Um, what are the mechanisms and, the, and, and the, the ways in which one can allude to at least what Samir Amin, I think, wonderfully um, referred to as the possibility of creating sovereign national projects of interconnectedness within the South as mechanisms for um, not just delinking, that's a very crude characterization of his work, but in order to create the possibility for something else. Um, so that's my rather roundabout question, question to you. Imperialism in class, please. Uh, and and why, why didn't you uh, say more about that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Neil, shall I go ahead and answer? Yes, an please. Answer? Okay, please. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt an answer. Um, the easy answer is to say time, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, made, I made a choice in favor of uh, emphasizing some parts of the argument and hope that you know, you know, questions would allow me to elaborate on other parts of the argument. Um, Samir Amin, I have reread, uh, and I was writing an article that was looking at the notions of uh, the emergence, first uses, I should say, not emergence, but initial uses um, of the words center and periphery in discussion. So um, Samir, I mean, I've reread, Wallerstein, I've reread for the purposes of the same project together with uh, Cardozo, actually. And the uh, arguments re related to discussions related to um, class and imperialism played a very important um, role in those discussions. And mm -hmm. for that piece, what I was trying to do was to see whether um, the notions of center and periphery as that was being developed by those scholars, right? In uh, Amin's work and Cardozo's work, Wallerstein's work. And there are others who were in, in, actually very aware of the kind of work that each other was doing. M Masri is, is a part of that. A circle, not closely connected, but still never uh, still connected. They were influencing each other's work, look at, looking at very different parts of the world, it has to be said, and making arguments related to the ways in which um, capitalism was shaping, um, shaping international uh, relations. The argument that you have a center um, within the periphery, and then there is a periphery within the center is developed around that time. And the, the article um, that I was writing at the time, it's about to uh, come out um, this month, uh, was actually saying that in globalizing IR discussions, we have lost that critical edge to the mm. center periphery notions as they were being developed at the time. So yes, I mean, I, I could have referred to, I, I mean, as alongside um, Wallerstein, I could have also referred to, you know, the critical work that was done by um, others, um, others in terms of um, the material, especially the material relationship uh, between um, the uh, center and the periphery, the constitutive dimension of that. I made a choice to favor those who were making, um, putting emphasis on the ideational dimensions of, of things, because that's where I was trying to go to, not because I want to privilege that, but because I thought that's the le le less developed part of the argument. I don't know if you find this a satisfactory answer, but <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity to elaborate on that yeah. to the thank extent you. that I can. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have two more hands so far. Uh, so Nicola and then Kiran. Thank you, Pinar. That was such a fantastic talk. And I really, really, really enjoyed the way you laid it all out. Um, that was so impressive. Uh, so I would actually like to take you up on your offer to provide some more examples of um, contrapuntal readings of texts. Um, 
I think that for me, when, when you were talking about it, I immediately I thought, wow, this sounds like an amazing way to structure um, a course, mm -hmm. you know, at, at university to have like a very familiar text or a mainstream text in conversation with um, a, a, a lesser known or, 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 un, or unfamiliar text. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would really appreciate some examples of um, those sorts of contrapuntal readings that you've done. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm only, I myself are only get, getting into this. There are other colleagues who've been doing this uh, for, for longer. And um, there is a millennium special issue from some years back and you'll have, um, Gita, the late Gita Chowdhury's work on Said and contrapuntal reading, and she identifies a number of IR scholars who are already doing that. Um, I've, I've attempted to do this more recently, both in my book to a certain extent, but that there uh, it remains it's still very uh, theoretical. And more recently, I looked at the 2015-16 uh, migration crisis in the Mediterranean, and adopted a contrapuntal um, reading um, method to be able to study that. More often than not, we are familiar with the story that you know the newspapers that we read tell us about what was happening in 2015-16. The newspapers I read in Turkey, or the newspapers that we read, I was in Denmark <laughs> at the time, so we were reading there. Um, the scholarship that was being produced at the time was also looking at this, sometimes from a humanitarian perspective, sometimes from a critical perspective, but almost always from the vantage point of our concerns, humanitarian concerns or state-based concerns, but concerns as viewed from the north of the Mediterranean, let's put it this way. I'm not going to say Eurocentric, but the north of the Mediterranean. Now, I've, I've read these, narratives that were being produced at the time, together with what Fatma Mernissi, Moroccan sociologist, Fatma Mernissi had to say about the crisis, series of crises that, you know, that policymakers, but also intellectuals have faced in North Africa or the Arab world from the beginning from the 1950s onwards. Now, she was, long gone at the time, so she was not writing about the 2015-16 um, uh, uh, migration crisis. What she was writing about was very interesting to read next to the accounts of the 2015-16 crisis, because even the most humanitarian um, accounts talking about the crisis were looking at the issue in terms of immigrants arriving in Europe, right? And those immigrants don't seem to have the kind of um, gender relations that we have in Europe. And therefore, this is going to be harmful for the achievements, the sacrifices and the achievements that women have made over the years. Women is an, as a subject of security. It doesn't happen very often, right? V women being made the subject of security in newspapers, let alone ever let alone the more traditional security articles. But that was the analysis at the time. It may have changed since then, but that was the analysis at the time. Now, putting this next to what Marnisi has to say about the ways in which um, some great powers, some of which Western European, others North American, right, have been working together with the more conservative elements in the Arab world, and she met, she singles out Saudi Arabia, right? Working with the more conservative elements in the Arab world in changing the dynamics between genders in the Arab world in particular, but the Muslim world in, in, in general. That's a connectedness, which is security related, right? But never makes it into our contemporary analyses, not in terms of why the, um, crisis happened, that's a question, right? Not in terms of why the question happened, but why do we have these insecurities in the Arab world, Muslim world, women's insecurities, right? So that, you know, attending to the insecurities of migrants becomes a problem. 
that's a kind of connectedness that you know you can't really um, uh, discover by yourself if Marnisi, who's a sociologist, not an IR scholar, does not draw some of the connections for you starting from the 1950s onwards in terms of the collaboration between uh, great powers in um, making sure that the um, Saudi regime re stays resilient. Um, there's also Tim Mitchell's work, uh, of course, um, in terms of the um, the way uh, energy sector uh, works, the economy of the energy sector sector works. Um, so we can also draw on that. So that's what I'm talking about, really. Putting next to the contemporary analysis of the 2015-16 uh, crisis, women as the subject of security, and what Fatma Mernissi has to say about women as the subject of security, and you know, identify the connections in between. Some may think it's far-fetched, uh, right? But others think um, that it actually clarifies some of the things that we were unable to clarify in our everyday discussions on the on the migrant uh, crisis. So that's one. It came out uh, in, I think it's still on online review. Um, I can send you the reference if you're interested in this afterwards. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Kiran, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Bilgin. That was incredibly enlightening and very instructive. I loved it. Um, and um, my question is, so I'm wondering if these efforts to like the center theory and concept at their core and to read contrapuntally and to otherwise like decolonize the study of the Middle East, are they kind of countered or stifled when we, um, when we think about how these conversations and efforts are taking place within the confines of like neoliberal Western academies and even neoliberal non-Western academies. These are places where like problematic, sorry, epistemic and um, like Eurocentric traditions still guide things like who we write for, what gets taught, what gets published, things like that. And I think I'm asking this because I'm a student of IR and of, of the works of many of the scholars that you mentioned. And I think for me, it still feels uncomfortable, if not a little unjust to have these conversations within institutions that themselves have colonial histories and colonial legacies. Um, so I wonder if the right thing to do is almost to, to leave IR or leave the academy so we can square this problem, or is it possible to square it essentially? Okay. Well, you don't need to have institutions that have colonial histories uh, for them to be stifled. Uh, actually, you know, I, I mentioned my training in Ankara in international relations, right? Um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, just after the end of the Cold War. And the kind of IR training that I received was more Eurocentric than perhaps the training I received afterwards in Aberystwyth, right, in Western Wales. So it's not just the institutions, it's not just the colonial history of the institution, it's the way in which our institutions learn, right, and the institutions sometimes um, learn as well, or um, they seek to position themselves in, in that very neoliberal world economy. We're all familiar with um, universities, say in Turkey or in, in the Gulf or in, in, in Asia seeking to locate themselves in the world, right? And sometimes they're less open to decolonizing the curricula than you know, an, an, an institution in the UK that may have a colonial history, but may actually be interested in, in, in doing this and open to doing that. I'm not underestimating the kind of challenge that, that we're faced with, but I said, as, as I said, I'm not pessimistic at all. Right, the kind of change that we've observed in the past two years is 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 an example of that. There is no reason for being too pessimistic. It takes time. I understand that, right? But a lot has been achieved in the UK academia in the past uh, two years. I'm seeing the discussions has changed so much that it's sometimes difficult to keep up with the changing um, changing discussions. Um, my thinking on this is to remain ready. Right, our institutions may be lagging behind, right? But our students are not. Okay, our students are, are, are ahead. And what we're doing is actually for them to the extent that we're allowed to do. I understand that we're operating within structures and limitations. But, um, you know, so long as we have our students who are interested in what we do, uh, we, we owe it to them 
to be ready for all of this. That's the kind of opt I, I owe my optimism uh, than to the students more than to my perhaps colleagues or the higher uh, administration in our respective institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, more more questions, please. Uh... Dina, please. Hello, hi. I'm not sure if you can hear me very well. I'm actually outdoors and I've been accidentally locked out, so I apologize if you hear cars or angry seagulls, but um, thank you for an excellent uh, lecture. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question on centering the agents that are, or the scholars that are expected to sort of decenter the way that we narrate on and construct IR theories. Um, and something that you said that I found it sort of reminded me of um, a very formative experience in, in my education where I was actually a, a back at Orani student. I took several classes with him. And in this uh, sort of post invasion of Iraq context, I remember there was one class where he got a particularly bad review from an American study abroad student who said that he was giving too much space to the radical Arab in his classroom, referring to me, because it was just me and a bunch of American students studying in Cairo, um, again, in a sort of post-Iraq invasion context, you know, you can imagine the kind of polarization that was framed in these arguments in a sort of IR and security studies context. And he found this very funny. Um, he found this experience very funny. But for me, as a young undergraduate at the time, it was a sort of a very, it was a a moment where I realized that the positionality of the people producing the scholarship um, is sometimes a reason for backlash against the arguments which they are saying. Um, and I think, you know, for me at the time, it was probably a reason why it was uh, IR was a sort of subdiscipline of political science that I couldn't relate to and I didn't find to be a home. Um, and it's not really a radical proposition in other disciplines to center reflexivity and conversations around positionality. What, but I don't feel that that conversation is very advanced and security studies and IR. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, about this, this issue of positionality and reflexivity around who these scholars are and why it's so easy to brand and to question the legitimacy of writers working from their respective regions simply for saying the views that reflect their worldviews um, and their lived realities. So I'll stop there and thank you again. Well, no, and thank hope you, you heard that. <laughs> Well, I've heard it. You may find that I haven't understood everything, but I have. I've, I've heard the question. So correct me if I have misunderstood you. Um, that uh, the conversation in international relations is not uh, well advanced is one aspect of um, what you were saying. And the related question, as I understood, was is that um, positionality matters as regards who produces this critique, and it's sometimes too easy for some people to be discredited and you know, written out or not properly heard compared to um, some others. Now, yes, the conversation is not well advanced in international relations, right? Um, but what we're also witnessing is um, the privileging of uh, some voices, and this is a point regarding positionality as well, privileging of some voices simply because of their positionality as well. That's also happening, and we've got to acknowledge that. That's not something that I'm entirely comfortable with either, right? Um, to, to privilege some people because of where they're located, be it in Western Europe or outside of Western Europe. The issue of location is important, of course, right? It shapes the way we approach things, but it is not everything, right? Um, if the, you know Where I am and where I was raised and where I was trained does not, it, it informs, of course, me, but it does not mean everything in terms of what I am allowed to say, what I am able to think about. So positionality is important in terms of the structures and how people relate to us, I understand. It used to be much more negative, of course. Now there is a positive side to that as well, right? People are interested in non-Western um, voices and turning to uh, scholars from outside purely because they happen to be lo located outside of Western Europe. So there is some of that happening as well. I'm not comfortable with either of them, okay? And uh, let, me, let, me, let me say this, positionality is not everything. I know it matters, but it is not everything. Regarding the conversation not being well advanced in international relations, I recognize that. 
And more often than not, my students remind me of that. They get bored with the kind of IR training that they receive in our departments, in our universities, and they go into sociology, they go into other fields that they find are more interesting. I understand this. There, some fields are less conservative, some fields they find more interesting. But my response to them, and you know, I'm never able to convince them, but my response remains the same, is that then we're leaving security studies, we're leaving international relations to those who are doing the same things and saying the same things all the time. Those, you know, what they, my students regard as the boring stuff. So I'm not willing to actually do that, right? I'm not willing to um, go into other fields and let um, the study of the international be stifled that way. I'm not saying that what I, you know, what I say matters that much, but in my own corner of the world, in my little corner of uh, security studies, I continue doing um, what I uh, want to do, and I'm hoping that you know a couple of students hear me uh, every year, and that you know they, their thinking is also shaped to a certain extent by what, what, what I have to say. These are modest ambitions you may uh, find, but um, you know these are I've remained modest in my ambitions um, in my so at, at the moment 20 years plus um, career in security studies and international relations uh, so correct me if I am misunderstood you um, but that's the uh, my, that's my understanding no thank you very much that was excellent and my, my primary point was about the backlash against individuals simply because of their positionality but I understood your point thank you again thank you John please mm. Yes, uh, hi everybody. Thank you so much for that uh, really uh, wonderful and thought-provoking uh, lecture, Pinar. Um, can I just ask about, uh, it goes back to a point you made at the beginning where you say, in a way with some surprise, why is it, or you, you, you set up the puzzle by saying, why is it we're still sort of talking about um, decolonial or anti-colonial phenomena, you know, 40 or 50 years, after, for instance, Said wrote uh, Orientalism and or since he developed this contrapuntal uh, reading idea. And, and it's sort of, so um, what, what I wanted to ask is, so that reading, the idea was developed, you know, especially as part of a, of a challenge to Orientalism, mm. a way of reading high text novels uh, from the sort of canonical literature, you know, especially that image in Jane Austen of Mansfield Park, which is, it all rests on a, on a sugar plantation, but that's barely mentioned. So there's a kind of phenomenal erasure that the contrapuntal reading seeks to kind of unearth. And, and what's nice is, you know, the idea of a kind of a harmony on the surface but because the, the contrapuntal uh, uh, rhythm is in harmony with the, the melody on the top, which is the kind of Mansfield part, which all looks rather marvelous. But actually, when you look into it and you do the reading, you find something dissonant by looking at the, the you know, the sub rhythm or the sub melody. I suppose, I mean, that's one way of reading, you know, the contrapuntal idea, uh, but that you find something that disturbs that was erased somehow because it apparently was harmonious. But when you dig into it, so, okay. So if that's something about a contrapuntal reading, then uh, and remember designed for uh, a, a text, a canonical uh, text of, 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 you know, Western thinking about the Orient type thing. What has, in what way is that reading now new how is it linked to something called the decolonial rather than a challenge to Orientalism and colonialism? What therefore does it mean to say coloniality rather than to say colonialism? Um, is it that we haven't learned anything since then? Or is it that there's a new context where there's a sort of unearthing of something called coloniality that was kind of unknown to Said and others? But or just is that contrapuntal reading uh, something new when it turns when it has this extra term decolonial and just my little provocation is of course you know I was a student in Cambridge in 1989 and I, the first thing I learned about colonialism was something called decolonization 
And it was a kind of very staid process that the British were kind of in control of and the Labour government of post 45 had sort of got it into its head that it was going to do decolonization. So just to say, for me, reading Said and then, you know, Third World National Liberation Movements and Said, it was all, it threw that whole thing into a cocked hat. You know, decolonization was something that was old and Anglo-centric and, and, and anti-colonialism and Third World National Liberation was something new to me, right? But then you come to the present and you find everybody's talking about decolonialism. So that that's my, anyway, just so, is there a traveling and an updating of contrapuntal readings? Uh, and is that what's meant? Uh, 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 thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, now, what I meant uh, by this, and I admitted uh, in the beginning that I'm suggesting something, this is not by no means a fully fledged argument. This is something that I'm all still thinking about, but it does, it, did surprise me, my own thinking surprised me perhaps when I was reading the conference text, right? Said, 40 plus years on, right? Every other field that I am familiar with references Said's work in terms of how they started to change the way in which they do things owing to Said's Orientalism, right? And Orientalism was about the study of the Middle East. Yet, you know, 40 plus years on, we seem to be completely colonized. That's, the, the, that's what I find puzzling. But, you know, this is not, perhaps I should not really be surprised by this. When I was starting to do my PhD in, uh, in, in, in uh, abreast with on critical security studies, looking at the Middle East in the 1990s, uh, it did not, uh, no, Said's book was not the one I picked up first. Although I had read Orientalism as a student uh, at, uh, in, in, in Ankara studying international relations, it did not occur to me that this was something that I can draw inspiration from, if not a theoretical perspective from, to study with security in the Middle East. It was one of my supervisors who suggested, you know, why don't you go to make use of Said as well as this Frankfurt School critical theory perspective that you're making use of. This is, it's, it could be my ignorance, but it could also be, have something to do with the fact that we are not really make use of him in the way that some other disciplines have made use of him to call it decolonization, call it, you know, um, restructuring of their own fields. That was the observation actually. And I merely suggested um, an, an answer to that. And I suggested that perhaps it had to do with the fact that he was writing about the Middle East. So the empirical point, we may have focused on the theoretical point, we may have actually um, overlooked which other fields may have um, picked up and concentrated on. The second part of uh, your question, as I understood it, um, so far as I follow it, the discussions of the 1970s and 80s are mostly to do with materiality, right? What I remember, I identified three, connected, three kinds of constitutive connectedness. One is the material, the other is self other, which is you know, what the critical uh, approaches focused on in the 1990s and 2000, early 2000s. This third aspect is not always there. It's definitely, it's, it's hinted at, right? It's there in a certain, to a certain extent. Fanon hints at it, uh, Wallerstein hints at it, especially in his later work, he talks about it. But it's, it's not central, this con connectedness of ideas in different uh, parts of the world. You don't necessarily see it in, uh, in Wallerstein until his later works. And those are um, in, in the perhaps the last decade of his, um, of his life. So it's not really making a comeback. It's not the same ideas that are making a comeback, right? It's, a, it's the exploration of different kinds of connectedness that, 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 that has become focal, I think. So it's not a return. It's, a, it's perhaps the better term would be a renewal of interest in Said's method to explore things that we may have left unexplored before. But let me once say that there were always, you know, pioneering works who were doing exactly that but they don't always make it to our <laughs> sometimes reading lists or become uh, central to analyses. 
we're making them more central to our discussion so far as I can tell in the last decade, especially the last few years or so in international relations. But um, I think it was, it was Dina who had already said that IR is, uh, is, is, is conservative, may not necessarily be the best place to start these kinds of um, discussions uh, anyway. So she said it better than I. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go to Joshka, then I'll read a question from the chat, and then we'll go to Tristan. Okay. Hey, thank you, Pinar. It's always great to hear you and, and learn uh, again uh, from you. Uh, this um, I, I have a question about your remark about this, the Eurocentrism and access of knowledge, because I thought also you know, it's operationalized as well in what I would call sort of the Anglo-Saxon linguistic wall. Um, and I, I would like to have your reflection a bit about the issue of languages of publications and mm -hmm. translations. And related to that as well, um, your reflection on co-writing with, for example, interlocutors, if you're doing participatory mm -hmm. methods um, in terms of co-production of knowledge in that sense, and, and in how far you know, why are we at, if you're talking about IR and security studies, of course, I'm coming from, from anthropology, but um, I, I'm just thinking of it, you know, where are we at and how, what are the possibilities for that? What are your reflections on that? Okay, right. Thank you. Um, Neve, are you going to read the question now? Or yeah, I? maybe I will, because we're getting other people raising hands and so... Now, I'm not sure I understood it, understand it. It's a question by uh, Mekia Nejar, and it is, thanks so much for the incredible presentation. You mentioned the ordering of the world and knowledge power dynamics. How can we calibrate the quote unquote silencing of, of theories and agency recovery of MENA? Also, in terms of the lingua franca in knowledge production. Okay, so the second part of the um, question is related to the question Petroshka is asking as well. So, agency and re re recovery of MENA. Okay. Um, now, language issue is, is, is a complicated one for me as well. As I said in the talk, I only know two languages. And you know, one of them is the language in which I lead my daily life, right? And the other one is my academic language. And you know, my Turkish is not as well developed, however limited my English is, my Turkish is even worse. Okay. So on the one hand, we are limit, I am limited by the Anglo-Saxon linguistic wall, right? But on the other hand, this is how um, many of us who are trained in English speaking, English medium universities have lived all their lives. It's, it's, an, it's very interesting and it's also related to the structures of knowledge production as well. The rationale for English medium universities in, in, in Turkey is to be able to follow the literature because there simply was not enough of it in Turkish. That's why they got started. Now it's a, it's, it turns out to be a more um, efficient way of training students, but also um, keeping them connected to the rest of the world. It made the rationale made different in different uh, contexts. So it, yes, there is a linguistic wall there, but it also creates opportunities depending on where people are located and what opportunities are open to them. I think equally or, or more than language itself is the way argument is structured in the what you refer to as the Anglo-Saxon world. That's a bigger challenge I find. The way that we make arguments in our respective cultures may be very different from the way an argument is expected to be made in say EJIR or ISQ or, or security dialogue. That I consider to be a less acknowledged part of the problem for us communicating across cultures, across academic cultures, not just linguistic um, walls, but you know these kinds of, of walls exist as well. There are of course those who are trying to you know uh, surpass exactly that, right? So there is some acknowledgement of this, um, and there is this uh, Paris collective led by Didier Bigot and his coll colleagues who are trying to actually go beyond exactly that. That there are you know um, disciplinary boundaries and ways of uh, for making an argument and how we can think creatively um, beyond that. So I. I, I acknowledge that uh, very much. Um, so this goes to a certain extent about the, uh, you know, the 
English being the lingua franca in, in knowledge production as well. It is a challenge, but for some others, it becomes an opportunity to be able to connect to the, um, to the rest of the world, especially in contexts where this kind of decolonial, critical, um, inspirational discussions don't exist. Right. So, you know, then you exist that then you connect to the discussions because uh, of um, because of being connected to uh, via that uh, language. The other part of your question, co-writing, co-production of knowledge, um, you'd be more familiar with this. This is not something that I've looked into, but I've heard others uh, speak at this conference about this, how to do this without recreating or feeding into already existing hierarchies. I understand that that is the challenge at the moment. I do not really have a satisfactory answer to that simply because this is not something that I have thought about or um, I've read about it, but it's not something that I have um, thought thought about. But I know that you know it's, it, it's a huge challenge because already existing hierarchies already put in, us into certain roles when we try and work with um, other parts of, of the world. When it comes to um, the Turkish context, I find myself in between two worlds, right? So I may be the periphery in some center periphery relations, but I may end up in the center in some other center periphery relations. So I have an awareness of, of that complication as well. Um, as I said, reflexivity is not enough, but that's the only tool that we have when it comes to uh, addressing the, those kinds of challenges, I think. I know I don't have a satisfactory answer, but I recognize the challenge there. Let me attempt another part of this um, question, um, ordering of the world and knowledge power dynamics. How can we calibrate the silencing of theories? Um, um, silencing of theories, I'm not sure if it is referring to in, in international relations in general or disciplines in general, or uh, silencing of theories in some parts of the world, because I was in a session earlier today and um, uh, one of the speakers was uh, talking about how um, some theories are only taught in, um, in, 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 in universities in the, in the, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa and other th theories that uh, students don't even get to be introduced to, let alone um, even uh, in, in critical manner. Okay, so in international relations in, in, in general. Um, here, I think where you're located is important. Um, I only learned about um, mainstream theories of international relations and perhaps some introduction to critical international relations when I was being trained in Ankara, in Ankara, right? And I got introduced to critical approaches and including post-colonial approaches, um, mostly when I studied in, um, in, in, in Aberystwyth. So it's not just, um, I wouldn't say this is about, it's, it is an IR problem. It's to do with, um, I think, institutions and how they wish to uh, position themselves in the map of international relations. I'm not saying in the map of world politics, but in the map of international relations. I have colleagues in Pucrio in, in, in Brazil who are doing, you know, world scale work in critical international relations, right? They're locating themselves in the world of international relations, perhaps not in the world of Brazilian IR, but definitely in the world of IR. Um, in general. So silencing takes place in, in different, silencing takes different forms in, in, in different places. Some may think that, you know, realism is being silenced in some context. Others may think that, you know, constructivism is being silenced in some other context. I understand that um, some theories are more, have more power, um, discursive power in contemporary world politics than others. But having said that, the past two years has given me quite a bit of hope in terms of you know, good ideas, important ideas being brought to the surface um, and being you know, um, used to inform others of their limitations um, in, the right kind of, uh, in the right kind of context. So I don't know whether I understood the question correctly or whether the answer was a satisfactory one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, uh, Makia, is that fine or do you want to? Uh, uh, thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. That was fine, insightful. Thank you very much, Pina. Thank you. Okay. Very hard. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now let's go to Tristan and then Ahmed. And if anyone has more questions, please raise your hands after that. Tristan, please. Uh, thank you. Um, 
So I'm one curious, uh, how can or, or even should uh, attempts to decolonize area studies and the like reckon with the sort of co-option and misuse of anti-colonial language that you see in international politics? Uh, and there are some examples of that, right? But there, um, and I, um, but for example, um, sorry, let me rephrase. So, uh, and how can you deal with sort of modern or novel colonialism, uh, such as what we see out of China? So what I mean to say is that you, we have examples of people defending these sort of very um, hegemonic uh, policies, but in language that's explicitly anti-imperial. Uh, and so attempts by sort of Western countries or interest groups or universities to critique that are then attacked as colonialism um, by, these, by these powers. Um, and so they use the sort of language of anti-colonialism, but they use it to defend their own potentially hegemonic uh, ambitions. And I think one really great example of this in practice is uh, an interview with the Pakistani prime minister, uh, maybe it was a month ago or so, uh, where he was you know, attacked critiquing the Western involvement in, in Palestine um, and, and uh, the situation in Israel. Um, uh, but when the interviewer tried to ask him about the situation with the Uyghurs uh, in China, uh, you know, his response was, well, any issues we have with China, we talk about behind closed doors and we love China and they're helping us a lot with our economy and we don't know more comment on that, right? Um, and so there is a willingness to engage in the sort of anti-imperial rhetoric in regards to the West uh, and in regards to, you know, the, the history of colonialism with the United States and Europe, but a refusal to do that on the part of, of sort of novel imperial powers. Um, and so should uh, these sort of conversations include that or is that or should that be siloed off as a sort of separate conversation? And to what degree do you think uh, sort of um, decolonial theory and ideas is applicable to sort of the, the new forms of that influence that we see today? Um, okay, thank you. The final part of the question I can begin with, that's the more straightforward one uh, for me. My late colleague, uh, Lily Ling, uh, was the person who was making use of these ideas, post-colonial thinking, to look at China, China's relationship with the, not only with the West, that's her book, but also China's relationship with the um, smaller powers in, in, in Southeast Asia as well. So yes, definitely there are those colleagues who are making use of these post-colonial, decolonial ideas to um, look, at, um, look at relationship between South-South, let's call it South-South relations, right? I have, I also know of work done, being done by colleagues in, in, in Brazil who look at Brazil's relationship with Southern actors, um, the, the, the um, Haiti um, in, in operation comes to my mind, actually. Um, I don't have the exact references, but there is some of that work making use of post-colonial, decolonial ideas to look at South-South relations, what you refer to as more new forms of imperialism by new actors, not just all forms of imperialism uh, by old actors. So yes, there is that happening. Okay, um, the other part of the question was, um, that there are actors in world politics that are making use of this language, this critical language, right, that post-colonial, decolonial scholars are producing and making use of this language to be critical on the one hand of perhaps older imperial powers, yet while doing that, they are perhaps adopting very similar practices in other parts of the world. You refer to China and China's relationship with Africa is the one that is more regularly um, brought up, uh, but there are there may be other examples. I have um, co colleagues who looked at Turkey's relationship with Africa from a similar perspective as well. So the critique of the language is post-colonial, but what is being done in Africa is does not necessarily uh, sit well with post-colonial sensibilities, let's call them, right? Um, I'm going to refer to one final work, and th this is um, the Shampa Biswas's work on India that you may also be interested in, actually. Uh, the, her work on India and in India's appropriation of a critical language of nuclear apartheid, how the, uh, the post uh, non-proliferation treaty, um, non-proliferation pr uh, policies um, create a hierarchy between haves and have nots. And India, they consider as being mistreated as a result, as part of that 
the hierarchy. But then she turns it around and looks at how India treats its own minorities and how Indian identity is based on a similar hierarchy inside the country as to who counts and who doesn't, who's more human uh, than others. You know, uh, this is a very roundabout way of saying that, yes, you know, there are post-colonial, decolonial scholars who are actually very much aware of the appropriation of the kind of critique that they're producing being um, by, by, um, by policymakers and how then, then they produce critical work about that appropriation as well. This is happening. So no need to worry on that graph. Thank you. Ahmed, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you everyone for this amazing talk. And I would like also to thank all the team of Christmas this year, Nicola and your team. Thank you very much for this great opportunity and this great work you did this year. I have uh, 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 two questions, please. Uh, the first one about Said himself. Uh, yeah. Last few months, we have a reading group, a reading uh, uh, group with some colleagues about Said culture and imperialism, mm -hmm. and we ask this question, which I will ask you again: To what extent do we can consider Said a decolonizer mm -hmm. than post-colonial? Said himself, as it's very obvious in his autobiography, was a prisoner. Uh, in imprisoned with colonialism in, 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 in every aspect of his life, personal and professional, as you know. And to use wow, uh, Nigogi word, decolonizing the mind. So to what extent is this still valid to consider Said decolonizing? Of course, we rediscover him. I, I just uh, rediscovered counterbounded, like you kindly said, and it's mind blowing to understand the dynamics in Middle East. but. Looking at Said, comparing with other authors like Walter Manillo, uh, black feminism, for example, like uh, Ray kindly today mentioned uh, Edwa, uh, Samir Amin and William Stein. But for example, we have Janet uh, Abulogd before the Western hegemony. It's like before Samir Amin and before William Stein talk about uh, uh, world system, but no one talk about it because I don't know why. Uh, Audrey Lord. Uh, uh, Southern American uh, debated his school, but Said himself, to what extent we can rely on him? We rediscover him, of course, but I, I, I'm, I really need, uh, and I hope to hear your opinion about uh, his positionality as decolonizing or post-colonial. And the second question, again, like you, your, your kind uh, title was uh, today, like there is no nowhere to run, and I will use this one, no way to run from coloniality, right? Mm. So all the discussion and debate was uh, revolve or emphasize on colonizer uh, knowledge or mind. How can we move from colonizer knowledge to colonized mind, colonized knowledge, indigenous uh, knowledge, uh, native knowledge, to what extent, like today, Yusuf Shwari have a great remark in, in one of the session, and he said, I quote him, I refuse to be framed or perceived only in the frame of colonialism as an Arab or as a Muslim. And I will, I, I will take this position, why we have to look to ourselves in this frame. Like even Said himself, Said, everything he did, his great work, there's no doubt about that. But he did not escape this stage of colonialism. Like Foucault, Foucault never talked about before 15th, 16th century Europe. To what extent this process, ongoing process, radical process of decolonization, of knowledge, the meaning, we need to bring in non-Western form of power away from just taking uh, colonial, Western colonialism and imperialism as a point of reference. And thank you again for your talk. Thank you. Okay, I'll try and uh, answer them in, in, in turn. Um, we know about Said's contradictions. We've known them for a long time, actually. 
the absence of women in his work was brought up even before all of this, right? And um, there are other critics who brought up, you know, Said having, um, in terms of his formation, is a very, um, he, he has a very specific formation and intellectual formation, I mean, live along the class dimension of, of this very specific intellectual formation, a very specific intellectual um, tastes as, as well. So yes, so Said does not necessarily come across as the ideal person to turn to uh, when it comes to decolonizing knowledge. It's, you know, everyone who turns to Said uh, is very much um, aware of this. I turn to Said not in terms of the answers that he provides, although some of them are actually very inspiring. I turn to him for his method, which I, uh, which I then utilize for things that he may not even approve of in terms of the kind of research uh, that I do. I find that method more, um, more helpful than the kind of answers uh, that, uh, that he provides. And the, the, the method I find to be helpful than anything else that I have, that I have come across. Having said that, um, this uh, this kind of um, the when he talks about contrapuntal awareness, he refers to uh, the particular advantage of what he calls the exile, the epistemic advantage of the exile. Those who can exist in two different worlds at the same time, not just culturally, but also in terms of uh, the, not just linguistically, not just culturally, but also in terms of ways of uh, thinking as well. And this we don't only find in Said actually, he's the one perhaps who articulated this better than others, but we find this in Adorno, right? We find an aspect of, 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 of this in, I've recently read Uma Narayan's work, she talks about this with reference to feminist epistemology as well. So in a number of different places that is, you know, one does not have to turn to him uh, to be able to make use of this kind of approach. When Walter Mignolo talks about, that's a proper decolonizing scholar, right? Well, when uh, Mignolo talks about border thinking, he's also referring to that, right? Let's grant this though, and Mignolo also says this, just living, on the border does not allow you to have privileged access to border thinking, right? So it's not only a matter of who we are, where we are, we're returning to that functionality uh, question uh, once again, but what kind of methods of thinking that we are, uh, we're trained in? And I find Said helpful in that regard, though I, I do acknowledge that there are others who we can um, turn to, and I should revisit uh, Abu Lugov. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that reference, that's very helpful. Okay, the second question, um, nowhere to run from um, coloniality. Now, I'm, lo I'm located in the Turkish context. If I were to submit a journal article, an article to a journal making use of post-colonial approach to study, approaches to study Turkey, the referee reports are immediately going to come back and say, well, Turkey was not colonized. What's the point about analyzing Turkey from a post-colonial perspective? Right. So um, I'm not saying that, you know, we don't, those who do not want to be analyzed from a decolonial perspective are making the same point. But I think there is something to be said about us all being shaped by coloniality, even when we're located in contexts that have not been colonized. I understand from the decolonizing discussion, I take the de from the decolonizing discussion, the relevance of this coloniality. And they remember, you know, you would like me to know this better than I do, that they started with the, with, with the Americas. They do not start with, um, other uh, starting points, definitely not um, Europe, Europe or Middle East based um, starting points. So it's, it, their starting point is different. And the relevance of the points that they make regarding us, all of us being affected by this is, um, is something that I consider to be relevant, not defining in terms of, right? Uh, so I understand the point about refusing to be defined by this, yes. Right. So, but I do not necessarily think of this only as a Western European concern. It's not only for those who belong to empires. It's not only for those who were part of empires. It's not only for those who were colonized. All of us in different ways are affected by 
um, colonialism, right? I'm, I'm making this argument being located in Ankara, knowing what, fully well that I go against the grain of the of mainstream discussions uh, or even critical discussions here as well. So it's not being defined by this, but let's like acknowledge that if our concepts are shaped by um, by this uh, this let, let me call this a legacy, then there is no running away from it. it we need to acknowledge it um, head on. Um, a related point to make, of course, um, here, you did not ask about this, but I'm going to make, make use of this as an opportunity to say this uh, nevertheless. I was um, invited to talk about critical approaches to security in a workshop um, somewhere in the Middle East. Let me not name the, the, name the place, right? And what I did was to talk about uh, critical approaches to security, taking Bhagat Korani as my starting point, you know, not. Uh, Frankfurt School, not Paris School, not Copenhagen School, right? Or Bourdieu or um, Habermas, but I took Bhagat Korani's work as my starting point because I find his, his, the work that he produced in the 1990s as excellent critiques of mainstream approaches to security, right? Now, this is an attempt to be refused to be to refuse to be defined by you know either coloniality or decoloniality. It, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a rejection of a starting point. Um, the students did not think so, right? The students wanted to remain within the um, the, the more traditional uh, critical IR um, starting point. So I met with their resistance to um, try and move away from the um, from, from from these Western European starting points. So there's that as well. Um, Ikea was previously referring to the silencing of theories. It does not always, and someone else asked about um, institutions stifling us. Let me see if I can find the find, find the name. Institutions stifling us. Uh, yes, Kiran asked about that. But sometimes our you know our audiences uh, attempt to stifle us as well, right? It's all us uh, about all of us are trying to locate ourselves in this map of international relations, not only you know, geopolitically, but also epistemologically as well. So we are running against a number of different, um, different uh, hurdles. Um, we have to go through a number of different hurdles as we try and make these um, points. I know I you know, digressed, but I couldn't miss that opportunity to make a different point. Thank you. One last question and we will conclude. So this is a question in the chat from uh, Atat Bataine, I think. Can you please comment on the role and impact of the academia in decolonization versus the role and impact of the public sphere, I think, mm -hmm. especially in the present era? Also, has colonialism as a public order project been fully understood, or is our understanding an unfinished project? Um, okay. Both have important roles to play, I think. <clears throat> the events of the past two years, activism, on the part of people who are taken to the streets, reminded all of us the importance of race shaping institutions, including knowledge, right? That needs to be understood, granted. Okay. But if it, not, if it was not for people who've been producing this kind of critique and knowledge in the past 20 years, at the margins perhaps, you know, not in the most um, most central of positions, but if it was not for the, those people who've been uh, producing that kind of knowledge, informing um, the public, but also, you know, training their students to be receptive to this kind of uh, criticism, that also may not have happened. So there is a mutually reinforcing relationship between the kind of change that can come from the uh, universities, academia, and also the kind of change that can come from the public. This is the kind of uh, relationship that um, Ahmed is going to be upset with me, but Said is talking about when he talks about the responsibility of individual and in in intellectual, I'm sorry, but also intellectuals always needing an anchor for them to, to always having to be located in a struggle to talk about 
um, uh, something. So I wouldn't say it's either or. We need to be ready as academics to be able to um, inform the kind of change that we're hoping for um, in world politics. Okay, it there may not is be a satisfactory answer, but that's the only one I've got. Uh, in the meantime, one more question, Jump. Do you have, uh, can you take one last, last, last question? No, or two more, I see now. <laughs> uh, so let's take these last two, and I'm not taking any more. Um, so uh, from Amin Omar, thank you for the insightful talk. My question is, what is the alternative to the colonial framework we inhabit? If we undo colonialism from Middle East studies or IR, aren't we left with another hegemonic framework? For instance, in traditional Islamic studies, different colonial powers from the Mamluks to the Abbasids had an influence on knowledge production to some degree. To be more clear, what are we trying to discover through decolonization? And last question, uh, sorry for the last minute question from Daniela Musina. Can you expand a bit more on how to develop a methodology that would fit the notion of connected histories or sociologies? It sounds like empirically very hard to imagine and develop a method apt to grasp that co-constitutive character of processes you were mentioning. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, the article that I was referring to when I was re answering uh, Nicola's question is uh, came out in Geopolitics in, two in, in 2020. It's, a, it's the online version is only available, but that's exactly what I try to do in that in that piece. So without having the time to go through the specifics of that, uh, if you allow me, I'm going to refer to something that I have um, uh, written. And if you have any questions, Daniela, about this, um, just drop me an email and we can um, talk about that. Um, as regards Amin's question, this is something that uh, is, of course, uh, is becoming increasingly clear to me as I go in, in as I delve into uh, works um, in, in the attempt to discover connections, as I delve into uh, works in the Arab world from earlier periods as well. So exactly, um, you know, the kind of power knowledge relationship stifling of of, of debate, the impact hegemonic frameworks have on knowledge production. These are not new things, okay? So we can encounter the, this in different contexts in very different ways. You can encounter this in the Muslim world and in, in, in the, um, the Arab world in particular, but in the broader Muslim world as well. So I, I, I am increasingly becoming aware of this. And if you read um, the history and sociology of science uh, articles, Right, uh, it's becoming increasingly clear as well. As well. So, it's, thank you for bringing that that, that up. Uh, coloniality is important for us because I'm a student of international relations, and I have a field that has developed its concepts in that condition. That's why it is so relevant for us. But remember, I have also acknowledged, and again, it was a response to in response to one of the other questions that I was asked that. I am fully aware of this kind of critique being utilized by others in their own corners of the world for different hegemonic projects. So this is not, a, if you call it, a, if you want to call it a struggle, this is not something that's going to come to an end, right? The, and reflexivity, that's the tool that we have in international relations and critical theory, right? Reflexivity does not, you know, you can't really stop with that. It's something that we con con continuously to do checking on our own limitations, right? Personal limitations, institutional limitations, epistemological limitations, reflecting on that, reflecting on the kind of knowledge that we produce, not only others produce, remember, but we produce, and then keep, um, keep the critique uh, going and keep you know, challenging ourselves, not only others. So it is continuous, it's not going to come to an end, and it does not stop with some kinds of uh, colonialism. It needs to go beyond those kinds of um, all kinds of hegemonic uh, projects in knowledge production and beyond as well. Um, well, thank you for those questions. Um, you know, I made a note of all of them uh, and uh, I'll continue thinking about that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating, indeed brilliant lecture. I mean, I kept on writing as you were uh, talking and it was just uh, a great way, I think, to have the final plenary session 
of this uh, Brismas conference. Uh, and so please, everyone, you have a reaction thing. You can clap hands through that. And uh, I hope some of you or all of you will stick around for the next session, uh, the last session of the conference, I think. And uh, that's it. No, thank so. you. Well, thank you to everyone. This is the last day of a long conference. Thank you for, um, for showing up and for staying with, uh, with us and then asking these brilliant questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.